good, a good afternoon. We're going to do the uh, Hayabusa 2 touchdown rehearsal. It'll be a two-hour program. I'm the uh, uh, Eon engine engineer. My name is uh, Hosoda. I'm also the supervisor. Hi, hi, I'm a two engineer. I've been in charge of system. My name is Hiroshi Mamura. This broadcast. Uh, is uh, the asteroid sample uh, return journey and uh, the aim is to share uh, this uh, uh, momentous uh, uh, moment. There is a possibility that uh, the broadcast uh, may uh, be uh, terminated due to uh, technical issues. So uh, please take a look at the control room. This is uh, Sagamihara Hayabusa 2 control room. Uh, you're seeing the live video feed. Uh, it's now very neat. Yeah, compared with the old one, that's how you would feel. And uh, we will be talking about what's happening here. Now let's switch over to the PC. And um, so. I'd like to explain the schedule for this uh, two-hour broadcast. So what we're doing is the touchdown rehearsal, the third rehearsal. It's a rehearsal, so we won't actually touch down. Toward the touchdown rehearsal, we have started the descent yesterday, or maybe the day before yesterday. It will be yesterday. And uh, we're now one step uh, near the landing. Later, we will expand this part to uh, give you more details. So in the control room, they were preparing for the target marker uh, separation. They just gave the uh, uh, go decision. Uh, that was around 11. So the spacecraft would lower the altitude gradually and around 11.55 it will reach the lowest point and if the conditions are right, the target marker is going to be separated. What's the current altitude? So it's 334 meters, very close now. And we'll be watching the uh, spacecraft. And there's going to be a switch over of the antenna. And uh, there's some time where we won't know the uh, detailed situation uh, of the aircraft. So from 11.50 to 12.25, for about that 30 minutes, we won't have the details. But the spacecraft will follow the sequence. And uh, uh, it'll be around 12.25 uh, when uh, we will be able to know what's happening on the ground and uh, we will follow what's happening in the control room at that time. Uh, so the biggest aim uh, is a separation of target marker. So we won't be able to see that, uh, or we won't be able to see that, and the uh, spacecraft is going to do that autonomously. That's correct. That's the crux of uh, uh, this maneuver and the most difficult part of this rehearsal. So. Uh, we have uh, been operating to this point, and uh, I'd like to introduce a guest. So switch the camera, please. So he was in charge. He is in charge of operations. He has been doing operations uh, right until now, uh, Mr. Tsukizaki. So you were actually engaged in the operations until. Uh, now, so what was it like? So, Eon engine, Ion engine is my expertise, as is Mr. Hosoda. So, we were operating uh, with a NASA antenna, so I was the contact to NASA, and I was in actual operations until a few minutes ago. So, overseas stations, well, what do they do actually? Why do we need them? 
Well, telecommunications and operations uh, with the spacecraft requires a big antenna. It's on the other side of the sun. So when so we can only use the Japanese antenna during the uh, daytime in Japan. So during nighttime, we rely uh, on these uh, antennas in Spain and the United States. And uh, so when I joined, uh, we were switching from Spain to California. So California was just starting to be m uh, morning. So uh, I entered the shift at that time. I operated uh, for eight hours. And then we uh, switched over to Usuda uh, in Nagano Prefecture. So you can see that at the NASA site. Yes, uh, this broadcast is uh, uh, being delivered on the internet in real time. So let's switch over to the PC screen. So this is NASA DSN now. So you see the Madrid, uh, Spain in, at the top and Goldstone in the middle and Canberra at the bottom. So we were using until recently the Goldstone number 25 H, it says HYB2. So that's the antenna that was operating the Hayabusa 2. And uh, that antenna uh, will switch over soon to one of the antennas in Canberra. If that happens, even if there is a failure in the Japanese antenna, there's a backup. So whatever happens, we're able to uh, respond to those uh, situations. So these kinds of uh, antennas, uh, they don't exist everywhere. They're very limited. So with NASA, uh, we have a, a collaboration, and it's free of charge. It's because uh, the fragments that the Hayabusa 2 is going to bring back, we're going to share with the U.S. So we have that international cooperation agreement. And so with that, uh, they provide us uh, access to the NASA antennas. Thank you for that uh, explanation. So the Japanese station is uh, in Usuda. Yes, it's in Nagano Prefecture. So you you said the uh, main station and substation. So there's a main station and then there's the backup station. So you ended your shift and you came here. So what has the operation been like? So before me, uh, the Madrid antenna uh, was uh, uh, going well. And after I took over, uh, everything was uh, good, uh, so uh, we sent uh, uh, all the uh, commands as planned, and then uh, we shifted uh, to the Japanese antenna. So I think it was a tough shift o uh, overnight. Uh, so what was that shift like? Well, the, it's about the one third or one fourth the number of people. So just several people uh, doing the operation, uh, steadily doing the operation. So at around seven or eight in the morning, we have more people coming in. And uh, so this is the final stage of the rehearsal, uh, is what I felt. So that kind of tension uh, was felt there. So there's a briefing when uh, you um, move from one shift to another. And it's, it's a nice uh, meeting when everyone comes together uh, to confirm the various things. Uh, so thank you very much, Tsukizaki-san. And uh, now... Hayabusa 2 operation is continuing. So what is Hayabusa 2? I think uh, some of uh, you are uh, learning for the first time, so let us uh, give you some explanation. Let's uh, go to the PC. Let us give you a brief introduction. Uh, this is the size of the craft. It's uh, 1 meter by 1.6 meter by 1.25 meters. And when you open up the solar uh, paddle, that's on the right hand side, uh, it becomes about 6 meter width. And uh, with the fuel, uh, the weight is 609 kilograms. And the aim of Hayabusa uh, 2 mission, uh, well, the, uh, Hayabusa 1 uh, went to S type asteroid, uh, rocky type asteroid. Uh, with Hayabusa 2, we're going to the C type asteroid, Ryugu, which is rich in uh, carbon and uh, it's going to bring back the sample. So it's a sample return trip. And uh, uh, so in the primordial solar system, we're going to learn about the interactions between the minerals, water, and organics uh, to learn about the origin and evolution of Earth, sea, and life. And uh, the deep space exploration uh, return technology, which we demonstrated with Hayabusa, 
uh, we will further uh, brush up uh, so that we continue to lead the world. Yeah, this is about the schedule. In 2014, in this, on December the 3rd, the, it was launched and after initial operation, F4 engines successfully injected and after uh, Earth uh, swing bite, the after spending two years and a half, the finally it reached uh, Ryugu, uh, and uh, it will stay there for another year or so. And then, right around the time when the Olympic Games was uh, were over, it will come back to Japan, uh, to the Earth. I mean, uh, to the Earth in 2020. And uh, after arrival at asteroid on June 27th, uh, from July to August. Uh, it has been engaged in the uh, mid-altitude descent operation as well as gravity measurement descent operation after gathering data at the end of August. The various candidates for landing were identified with priorities and then after that, in early September, the first round of touchdown rehearsal TD-1R1 was performed followed by maneuver 2-1 operation and separation and landing were successfully performed. I'd like to invite uh, the person that was uh, involved in Minerva uh, later on as a guest. And then in early October, mascot. Uh, this uh, was uh, from Germany and again separation and landing were performed. And then touchdown one rehearsal 1A. That is uh, because uh, some of the uh, missions were Suspended, not performed to the till the end uh, for the first round, and therefore, in this case, uh, the uh, we uh, did rehearsal again and uh, went down to 22.3 meters in altitude, and now uh, we are engaged in the the rehearsal three, that is TD1 or three. Thank you. And we will continue operation, and at present, uh, the uh, altitude is less than 300 meters, right above uh, landing. Uh, or right above the ground. And now I'd like to explain more in details about touchdown rehearsal. The major objective is highlighted in red box. That is, uh, we want to confirm uh, the accuracy of the navigation guidance control. So this is explained in text, but uh, the visual illustration will better convey the what is the plan for this mission with Hayabusa 2 in descent phase uh, first lighter that that is a laser range uh, uh, the the measurement instrument as performed uh, and then at the same time it takes uh, images captures images uh, to identify the position to arrive at uh, the the destination and then uh, then for measurement LRF, another type of the a laser measurement instrument, is used uh, to measure the condition of the surface of the asteroid. And then, well, the uh, because Ryugu is in a self rotation, uh, the Hayabusa 2 will try to synchronize its uh, the the movement uh, by way of thruster uh, to drop a target marker so that it would uh, be in a position horizontal to the surface. And then flash is used. And then Hayabusa 2 will track uh, the target marker. And that function is confirmed. Then after that, it would once again ascend and comes back to TLM. During this uh, time, uh, various images would be captured these, some say that uh, this has been already performed before, but actually there is a major difference compared to previous rehearsals because the lighter was always used uh, for going back, uh, going down to a lower altitude and then came back. So it was just uh, descending and ascending. While as in this particular rehearsal, uh, they, that would be used uh, for control to realize a series of actions, the behaviors of this uh, therefore, the, the, in terms of difficulty, I would say that uh, this is far more complicated and difficult. And in case uh, all the conditions required are not met, and then we'll take a safer site uh, to abort the mission. If for survival, 
of the system. But if conditions are met, and then target marker would be separated. So the we have to wait for some time before it is actually confirmed. I think we'd better back to control room. What's going on there? We see smile. It appears that uh, they are now carefully following the altitude of LIDAR. And uh, gate recheck was already performed. So it is after failing goodbye and then relying on the system in the machine. And the separation was performed. And uh, you might wonder who are there in this room. Now coming back to the PC screen, well, roughly speaking, the in the center of the screen, and that's where supervisor is positioned. Next to him is a commander, the who is in charge of operation, and then project manager, the the person in charge of system, and AOCS. Uh, they are there, and also uh, the flight director. AOCS is about the altitude control and the OD for determining the orbit and also terrestrial system. Uh, the people in charge are positioned around here. Tsukizaki-san was uh, where uh, I was uh, sitting in the area that it is called the terrestrial system, including ground uh, the antenna. The, the ground system as a whole is in my responsibility. Well, there are so many functions, supervisors, f project managers, and uh, the flight director. All of them seem to be uh, the, those people in the high-ranking uh, kind of functions. But uh, could you explain about the different functions? First, about the project manager. Project manager is in charge of the entire mission of the project of Hayabusa 2. For instance, uh, the go-no-go -go decision was done by project manager and the target mar marker separation whether the separation was actually done or not uh, that confirmation is also uh, the judgment is done by project manager if he is happy everybody is happy and then when it comes to actual operation it is flight director who is sitting close to him so he is in charge of overall flight operation and flight director, for instance, would look at the altitude, uh, I mean the attitude, and then the, in case of any trouble, and then that will be first confirmed by flight director, and then instructions are given by him. So this is one of the important positions. Well, as in my case and Jatsuki zaki -san, we are called supervisors. So when judgment or decision are made by flight director, and then uh, the uh, the question is who is following uh, the progress of the operation. The supervisor is in charge of that function. We would not uh, be engaged in discussion for making decision and so on. That's how function is uh, divided. And when commands have to be issued to Hayabusa 2, it is supervisor that would issue a command. And because in case we are engaged in discussion, and then there could be a situation where we fail to issue a command at right timing. So the system is well designed. And as it is uh, the commander, that is actually directly in charge of issuing command. In other words, instruction comes from a supervisor, that is us, and then the command is transmitted by a commander. Uh, he is from a vendor. And then the Imamura-san is in charge of system uh, operation. The system in general, may I explain? It is about uh, the system in general, including the exploration system, documents, adjustment, coordination, everything. Because of enormous tasks task and functions, we have uh, two people, one from JAXA and one from a vendor or manufacturer. 
and then toward the 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 inside the the room the uh, the those in charge of guidance and navigation and control that is AOCS they are the ones uh, that would uh, develop a sequence according to which uh, the touchdown uh, is performed and although it is not uh, captured in that uh, the image there is another room where uh, the image uh, the navigation is uh, the performed uh, in the right next door so uh, the land the terrestrial systems in charge of antennas PC everything except the spacecraft so data accumulation telemetry uh, management all of that by the terrestrial uh, person we're very thankful for their efforts so both of you you're experts on ion engine uh, so, up, well, so the it's the up until uh, you reach the asteroid, uh, it's the uh, the ion engine is in charge. So there is uh, this work of uh, putting together the procedure. So, brief, to, uh, well, briefly, uh, command doesn't just come up on that day. So you start from the planning, and you make the command. And we have many people verify it, make sure there's no mistake uh, in the command. Once you get that approval, then you're able to register it. So based on the registered command, uh, you will actually do the operation. So before hitting that command, uh, f over several uh, weeks, uh, there is this uh, detailed uh, process. That's the uh, planning uh, stage. So many systems in place to prevent a human error. So there is double, triple check by humans and machines. So going back to the PC, there is the uh, orbit decision uh, person, OD. So you design or you calculate and decide uh, the orbit of the spacecraft right at this moment we're using Doppler shift uh, of the communications, uh, the con continuously monitoring if it's uh, going up or down. This is something we can know instantaneously, uh, even faster than the uh, PC screen is refreshed. Uh, so this is uh, the fastest way to n know uh, what the spacecraft is uh, doing. So. Uh, when the screen st uh, stops to be refreshed, uh, they continue to uh, watch it. Well, you uh, use the uh, uh, scientific term of uh, Doppler shift. What is Doppler shift? I think uh, this is uh, high school physics. You have the waves, you have this radio waves, and there's this frequency, and the spacecraft uh, emits some radio wave, and if it's moving, the wave frequency changes if the spacecraft itself is moving. So this oscillation, this frequency, you look at how it's changing, then you decide whether uh, the spacecraft is coming nearer or uh, farther. Like uh, when the ambulance is coming closer to you, uh, you uh, hear the siren at high, higher sound, but when it's uh, moving away from you, the sound becomes lower. That's happening in space as well. It's not sound, but uh, uh, with uh, the radio wave, uh, same thing is happening and uh, with that uh, we decide the speed uh, and the orbit uh, of uh, the uh, uh, spacecraft so we'll explain later with a different slide so there's telemetry so signal of data uh, from the spacecraft there's a period of time when we were not able to uh, receive that during that time still uh, Doppler shift measurement can continue so we don't know the detailed data, but uh, uh, we know the distance of the spacecraft uh, from the Earth uh, and the speed uh, at w which it is moving. So we can know if it's ascending or descending. That much information we can get with that uh, technique. So the altitude is uh, uh, 214 meters LIDAR value. So since we started, we've uh, uh, descended about 100 meters about 10 centimeters uh, per second. So uh, that's the speed.
go back to the PC. So uh, Hosoda-san explained the navigation guidance control. That's a key term. So in uh, our everyday life, maybe we're not familiar with this term, so let us explain. So navigation is about uh, learning where you are, your location, and uh, your attitude, which way you're uh, facing. So that's the I part of your body. Guidance is uh, upon knowing where you are, thinking which way you want to go uh, and decide uh, which direction you want to go. So that's the brains. And the uh, uh, control is uh, to make the desired uh, orientation or position. So this, these are uh, your extremities like your uh, legs uh, and your arms. So in this rehearsal, at the low altitude, can we do the uh, navigation guidance and control accurately? That's the key issue. So which devices are the eyes, brains uh, and the arms? So these are the equipment uh, on Hayabusa 2. There's the LiDAR here looking downward. So this is laser altimeter. So from high altitude, like uh, 25 kilometers, you can measure the distance to the uh, asteroid. So that, that's the eye uh, of uh, uh, this uh, craft. And there's another uh, device, uh, the optical uh, navigation camera, O, N, C, T, and W. And uh, uh, also we have the laser range finder, that's a short distance altimeter. So these uh, three are the eyes of the craft. And then there's also the star tracker, that uh, gives us the orientation or attitude. But the, the, those are the ma three major parts that make up the eye of the system. So I'd like to uh, show a video talking about uh, this uh, or these devices. So remote sensing uh, equipment on Hayabusa 2. So these are devices that can do scientific observation. So uh, laser range finder therefore does not uh, show up. Uh, so there are four measurement equipment on Hayabusa 2. So first is the ONC, optical navigation camera. So this gives us uh, the images. So T, W1, W2. So T is telescopic lens. So it can get images from far away. There's a filter wheel, you can change the wavelengths and can be used for scientific purposes. So this is when you're changing the filter wheel, you're deciding which frequency to take and uh, you can get uh, various information. And the resolution was shown earlier. So with the uh, filter wheel, you change the uh, wavelengths and you integrate all that information and uh, you try to locate uh, clearly where there might be existence of water. So this is used for scientific purposes but uh, also for navigation. So it uh, acts as the eye. Uh, of the navigation. So W1, W2 stands for wide, wide angle camera. So there are two such wide angle cameras. W1 is looking downward, W2 is looking sideways. So you combine those two and uh, y uh, you can cover uh, all the areas beneath the craft. So we have a te one telephoto and two wide-angle lenses. And uh, so we are using these. So NIRS 3, uh, not directly uh, involved in the navigation guidance control, but this is an observation uh, equipment. So it's located here. So there's a detector and it's a complex equipment. So the person in charge of this is uh, taking part and standing by in this operation. So scientific uh, 
observation is being made during descent. Yes, and so there uh, are the scientific uh, uh, personnel overseeing that, uh, and the data is being collected for uh, the uh, touchdown. So uh, there is the observation program that's being executed on the spacecraft. The data is being accumulated, and uh, tomorrow onwards, that data is uh, going to be downloaded back to Earth. So 175 meters, 177 meters altitude. So they're doing this kind of uh, observation from that kind of altitude using NIRS and the TIR, which uh, we'll see next. So this is also being used for such observation. About TIR, this is about uh, temperature measurement. The, uh, is it attached to minus C? plane and uh, the asteroid is measured in such a way. You you just mentioned minus Z, uh, the plane, and that's uh, actually to capture the temperature on the surface of asteroid. Because everybody wants to take a look at the asteroid and therefore the various components are tightly the built into this uh, the explorer, uh, therefore, it was extremely difficult to accommodate all those different technologies and equipments. And uh, the band uh, at the time of separation, the clearance and others are to be also measured. And this is about the LIDAR. This is also altimeter in a long range. The principle is currently illustrated here. Laser is shot and then reflection is captured by the telescope to measure the time that took for uh, the wave to come back. Actually, the laser range of uh, the meter is sold at the, 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 uh, the, the merchandise stores and uh, principle-wise, I think that will be the same. Again, the short-range mode and uh, long-range mode are provided and uh, if uh, the intensity is uh, too strong, and then the, uh, the measurement instrument could be destroyed. If it is too weak, then measurement cannot be performed, and therefore adjustment is done. At present, it is now down to some 100 and some meters, and therefore the measurement is being performed. 153 meters, that's the altitude right now, according to LIDAR. And at present, that's something quite tricky uh, because the, the, the image or the data that we are looking at right now is about 18 minutes and 30 seconds before. So Explorer by now could have already reached the lowest altitude because we have to be aware of two timings. That is what is happening right now at Explorer 18 minutes and 30 seconds ago, and at the time, at the timing when it comes back to the Earth. At present, it is 11:30. It is around 11:30, so it is around this time that uh, Hayabusa 2 has uh, reached the lowest altitude of about uh, 20 uh, meters, and. So after 18 minutes and 30 seconds, then we will uh, get the, the data that is captured from that altitude. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Tsukizaki. Now then. Uh, then we, have a, uh, we had a guest who was uh, the knowledgeable about the, the navigation, uh, the guidance, and now we have uh, the uh, Junichiro Kawaguchi, who was the project manager of Hayabusa. He is such a leading figure in this project, so you might be surprised. You know that uh, this is currently broadcasted by YouTube all over the world, together with simultaneous translation. Soon, uh, we will uh, get uh, data from the uh, lowest altitude. And what is the impression right now? I'm sure it would work, but uh, this is the first time to see 
And in the case of uh, the first Hayabusa, it was released in the air because of the flash and uh, the image capturing condition, the intensity of reflective light, and so on. Was something in question? Because that was the first time, therefore, we uh, try that approach. But in the case of Hayabusa 2, based upon that experience, now you know that uh, you can perform such a mission safely. We are very much interested in this. In terms of the rehearsal itself, we already explained that. Uh, but uh, if you can tell us about uh, what is the key and what is the most difficult, that is, uh, the fact that the uh, explorer is coming closer to the asteroid and about to land. Then we have to come back to the question of difficulty in landing. The, 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 the vertical uh, direction for landing is rather easy. Well, as long as you can do the measurement and if engine works, and then you know that uh, the measurement is being performed and therefore you know. Uh, but uh, the most difficult part of that is that uh, the Explorer is sliding uh, horizontally. It is uh, just like a trip over the edge of the curb. If it is a young man, then uh, he can uh, the restore his altitude, but in case of uh, elderly person, he might be tripped over and he might uh, get his uh, leg fractured, just like that. The Every second, 8 centimeters, uh, that's a speed. If uh, there, there is such a residual speed, then there will be some gliding before it finally lands and therefore it might uh, trip over on the ground and therefore the question is how we can the safely they land it to do that. In the case of human, you look at the ground and then you know uh, which way you are moving. But for a machine, it is rather difficult. There is no mark or symbol or no characteristics on the surface. And therefore, in order to know that, the artificial target is dropped. And that is a key. Just dropping a target, here again, some complexity, complexity is involved. Uh, because uh, when there is some right, uh, the, the bright object uh, next to that, then you can't tell which one is the target. That is why you use a flash lamp. When flash lamp is on and off, as you see here with this image, this is quite sophisticated because you do a subtraction and then you look at the difference and then extract that difference. And then with that, you can see the target marker. Can I come back to the, the personal computer screen? Well, because of uh, the absence of experience before, this is something that uh, you had uh, great difficulty in exploring the way to do this. Yes, after long and lengthy consideration, we finally came to this conclusion. At the time of the first landing by Hayabusa, to capture the image and lock on. And with that, for the first time, the landing was performed. In Mimurasam, now you have five target markers during design phase. What kind of consideration was given? As um, Dr. Kawaguchi just mentioned, uh, when it is uh, to perform touchdown, the after crater is created by impactor and a pinpoint. Uh, the, the explorer is expected to uh, the land. And uh, we also think about uh, using uh, those uh, and uh, the, the markers. Uh, the, we thought of a uh,
for ion engine. So Hayabusa 1 was a benchmark based upon which Hayabusa 2 was developed. For navigation as well, TSP and uh, the, the scheme to change the sequence is incorporated. What was it, the consideration behind that? I haven't been involved in the sequence directly. I have. I expect others to do a good job, uh, but uh, so I'm not too concerned. One thing that uh, does concern me is uh, when you go low altitude, GCP or the characteristic point uh, is not uh, preset, and so you might uh, lose it. So I do have some worries about the low altitude. But uh, GCP, uh, well, I think Mascot has been doing that uh, well, so I think it should be okay. So we've made a descent, many descents already, uh, and uh, I think we're getting used to it. I, we saw the flash being on now. So the fact that uh, we have a flash is something uh, that uh, is quite unique. Is there any other spacecraft with a flash? So, uh, we, we, it's not that if they uh, use the flash, uh, uh, it will light up the Earth. It shows how close we're going. So, in 10 minutes, the Hayabusa 2 screen, uh, we, uh, we will not be able to see for some time. Let's get the PC. <coughs> he said GCP part should not be a problem. So to some altitude, to coming down to some altitude uh, should not be a problem where there is a human intervention. So this time it's about 25 meters. So now we're going beyond and they're re going to release the target marker. This area is where you have some concern is what you said. Well, it's the first time that uh, we're doing this on the, uh, this voyage, so uh, the image processing, is that going to work well? And the background is darker, so that's better. So Hayab at when we did the Hayabusa 1, the background was quite uh, uh, bright. So C-type uh, asteroid has a darker background. I think that's advantageous. Uh, you never know uh, what will happen. For the LiDAR, it's quite tough because it doesn't come back it's w the signal is weak i hope that uh, all goes well Professor Kaguchi, uh, i think we need to go to back to the control room but uh, for hayabusa uh, 2 uh, and for japan can you give us a message now so all all who supporting us well hayabusa 2 uh, it says uh, uh, two, but uh, this is the uh, first trip of its kind. It's not uh, uh, easier because it's the second one. It's uh, brand new, so please understand that, and we ask for your support. And uh, with uh, this uh, accumulation, we can move on to the next uh, project uh, in terms of uh, planetary exploration. So we ask for a strong support. Thank you for your encouraging words. Thank you, <coughs> Dr. Kawaguchi. Thank you very much. The camera has now switched to the control room. <laughs> so it's now less than 100 meters and uh, people are checking the telemetry data in the control room. So gate 3, well, immediately before this, when they, they give the go decision for the final descent. So go, no go decision uh, w was made. Let, let's watch the video when that the decision was made.
So making this decision means that you trust uh, the spacecraft uh, to be able to navigate itself and you send it off with this uh, decision. Looking good. So at this point of time, we decide go. PMJ. No problems uh, on the terrestrial system uh, and the spacecraft. So we say go. So PMJ go. So that's how it was. So things seem calm. Uh, but uh, they have descended from 20 kilometers. It was a moment they were waiting for and making that decision uh, to send uh, the craft toward uh, the asteroid. It's difficult to ex expression. It's difficult to express, but uh, uh, it's a moving moment for people involved. So soon we will not be able to see telemetry. We're still seeing telemetry. Altitude 70 meters, down to 70 now. Hayabusa 2. Uh, the shadow on the asteroid is becoming much bigger now. <coughs> Let's go back to the PC. This is the Hayabusa 2 project page. Oh. So uh, we're, the navigation guidan guidance uh, image real-time uh, distribution is being done. So this is the OMC uh, w ONCW1 image uh, being displayed uh, almost real-time on our website. So we've come this close. So earlier we said that uh, uh, we have uh, lost communication, or we'll, we will soon uh, n not be able to have communication. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, eyes, uh, brains, and uh, uh, hands and legs. Uh, so, telecommunications uh, is the ear part, several antennas here. So, they're usually this high gain antenna with the highest gain is and can send uh, most data. That's uh, uh, oriented toward Earth. But uh, with target marker release, it's going to be uh, facing uh, the uh, surface uh, of the asteroid. And the, so the low gain, an, uh, it's going to be switched over to low gain uh, antennas. So that means uh, uh, less information. We won't get data. But as was explained earlier, uh, we can have the uh, Doppler range, so position and uh, speed we can continue to measure. So let us continue with the explanation. So the I part, so ONC and LIDAR uh, were explained in the video. Another uh, uh, device we're using for the eye is the laser range finders and uh, uh, uses uh, uh, four beams. Uh, to uh, detect uh, in a plane. So th three points are used. So you're measuring uh, the distance or measuring the time that the beam comes back and calculating the distance based on that. And so you know the uh, plane if you have three points, uh, but uh, there's another redundant beam, so four beams. And uh, uh, you measure the inclination uh, of the surface and altitude from the surface. So it's uh, uh, shooting at around the 30 degrees. So you have to come uh, relatively close uh, until, uh, before you can start to use the uh, laser range finders. So in the first rehearsal, uh, we looked at uh, the characteristics, characteristics at the altitude uh, below 40 meters. This time we're going to using we're going to be using this for the control. Compared with lidar, you have four lasers to get the plane information. 
correct? Yes. And uh, the, as for the brains, we have these uh, computers. It's an uh, 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 orientation uh, orbit control processor. This is not the only processor, but uh, this is the main brain uh, that's uh, uh, loaded onto the Hayabusa 2. As for the uh, legs and arms, uh, we have the chemical propulsion thruster. Uh, so on the 12 corners, uh, uh, hydrogen uh, fuel uh, is uh, released at high speed uh, and uh, with action-reaction, uh, you can control uh, the attitude uh, and orbit, uh, position uh, and uh, direction. When directions change, reaction wheel could be used as well. But this time for target marker separation, with it is thruster that will be used for changing position and direction. So that's how the system is designed this time. Now. Uh, the altitude now is 40 meters. Well, and uh, this is about the distance between uh, asteroid and Hayabusa 2. And so it will soon switch to LRF from laser at the same time. By switching antenna, uh, we will no longer see the uh, Hayabusa 2. Right now it is 41 meters. When it is descending, its attitude is like this, uh, with its back toward the Earth. Antenna uh, is uh, the the facing the Earth, and uh, the angle here is about uh, nine degrees between Sun and Earth, and therefore, the the power generation is done, and uh, it is uh, descending first uh, vertically, and then, according to the rotation of the asteroid, it would change and adjust its attitude. And with that, to the Earth, there will be some uh, different uh, the, the the angles uh, angle. Therefore, antenna can no longer face the Earth, and therefore, the uh, it cannot uh, send its image to uh, the Earth. Now it's down to 34 meters, as Dr. Kawaguchi mentioned. This is a limit of human intervention, and therefore. The below this, it is all up to computers on Hayabusa 2. Well, so far, Hayabusa 2 has been working in autonomous fashion, but uh, whenever necessary, a human involvement was uh, the, the decided. But uh, now we decided that we will all leave to the system, the computer, the target marker, and. The last time, the in the previous rehearsal, the altitude uh, has changed in such a way horizontally. Time is plotted vertically. Altitude that was actually measured. The altitude from the surface is shown, and the green line represents the measurement by lidar, which is usually usually used for measurement of the altitude, and yellow. Uh, this is about the laser range finder (LRF) that can uh, measure the both the altitude and range. So around 25, 27 meters, there was a switch over. What's the current altitude? 28 meters. As planned, uh, no more communication. So now this is uh, the staff in the control room. Uh, they are now gathering and looking at information in their response, uh, the, the information that uh, falls into their responsibility. There is a table where more people are gathering. That's about the Doppler shift that I explained earlier. That's about the telemetry. The abandoned information is no longer seen, but uh, from Hayabusa 2, it's uh, the speed uh, information can be gained, as well as position. And if the radio wave it is uh, connected, and then you can see that that is why we switch to low gain antenna. 
And they are now following her episode 2 with Doppler. So the, this is the moment of anxiety with four engines, its position of injunction and uh, direction of antenna were not well coordinated in the case of uh, the first Hayabusa and therefore that we could not get information and therefore we just followed Doppler. So this is a lifeline so to speak. Everybody is now watching a large screen on the wall. That's where Doppler numbers are displayed. And the control room. You see that they are following changes. Details are not known yet. Even at this moment, the sequence of the ex explorer that is uh, the spacecraft that is progressing as planned, a target marker separation and the tracking target marker during ascending. I think that's a, the operation w which is about to start. As you see on the screen, at around 11.55, it reached the lowest uh, altitude when target marker was separated, and the the time here is uh, the timing here at the Earth, and therefore it was actually about uh, 18 minutes ago. So we are now getting information by radio wave because of the time difference. Hayabusa 2 is quite uh, the clever. The information that is gained, uh, that some of them are triggered by the information gained by Hayabusa 2. Not everything is controlled according to the timing. That is why it says approximately around 11.55 and so on. And then according to Doppler, around 11.55, the altitude between uh, the, the, the spacecraft and the ground can be known. And uh, eventually, the, we will know around 12.25 when telemetry is back to function. We will find out whether the target markers are tracked or not. So for the time being, we are quite anxious. Well, it looks they are still quite calm, even when they might be anxious, just following the information on the screen. It's quite different from what you would see in NASA. True. Well, that uh, they have done what they have to do, and therefore we are now wishing for the best. And the system and uh, orbit decision people are following the Doppler information, and everybody else is also looking at the same information on the screen. target markers to release them. It appears that uh, the, they're now watching the how target markers are released. Of course, around 
once we confirm the actual operation that is taking place, and then we will know whether this is done properly or not. But uh, right now, we are just uh, relying on information based upon Doppler. Now, hovering is performed that is using LIDAR or LRF. Now, the spacecraft is staying at the, the constant uh, altitude. That information just came. They're waving hands, probably talking about Doppler going up and down. Doppler going up and down, meaning that distance from the Earth is uh, they're getting farther away or getting closer, and uh, speed is uh, increased or decreased, and so on. So we're not uh, professionals uh, about making this kind of broadcast. So if we're using two difficult uh, terms, uh, let us know through the social uh, streams. It's difficult, actually, yes, to do this kind of thing. So soon, well, if uh, it's all going according to plan, If something happens, if there is any development, uh, we'll come back to this uh, control room video. I'd like to uh, invite the next guest. Father of uh, Minerva, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yoshimitsu. So we are not getting the telemetry and uh, it's very close to the asteroid. So I'd like to use this time to ask about the great uh, success in the previous uh, uh, trip with the Minerva. So, do we have the PC screen? So, this is uh, the material that we use uh, for the press briefing. So, having a robot on an uh, asteroid, basically, that's unprecedented, wasn't it? If you look in the, in the past, in the 1980s, the former Soviet Union had this Hobos uh, Explorer. They had the lander and the rover and something to be stationary on the surface, so several probes. That was uh, at the end of the 1980s, so about 30 years ago. So it was several tens of kilograms, relatively large. And that was the last time. So we don't know what happened to that, unfortunately. Ho Hobos Explorer went to the uh, Hobos. They made the two spacecraft, and uh, it, it didn't go. Well, they were not able to. Uh, confirm landing. Uh, one uh, was lost in action to while traveling toward Mars. Uh, the other one, when they uh, tried to drop the probe to Hobos, uh, they, they lost track. So maybe it's stuck on Hobos, Hobos but that as of now they have not been able to uh, confirm. So Ho Hobos is a satellite uh, of Mars. So with MX, uh, that's what's being targeted. Hobos and Dios. So with MMX, we may be able to find that. So you have been in charge of Minerva and uh, Minerva 2 
from the first unit. So do you learn from the past or do you, did you start from scratch? Well, no, we didn't learn from what has been done in the past. Minerva won. Well, it's like a cube set, 10 uh, cubic meters, one kilogram. So it's about the same size. So CubeSat initial one was uh, launched uh, about at around the same time, one month difference. So we didn't learn from others in making something small. So Minerva 2, the current operational status, what is it? Right now, well, we're working on the touchdown and touchdown rehearsals. We're nearing the asteroid. So on the spacecraft side, the communication device is turned off. So right now it's not being operated. So it's not moving. It's not moving right now. Correct. But it's still healthy and the con operation continues. So two days ago, up, up until the morning of uh, 22nd, we had a data link. At that time, uh, it was stationary. But the last image we got, uh, uh, we got a, a stereoscopic image stationary on the surface. Now Hayabusa 2, uh, when they withdraw uh, from the asteroid, uh, we will turn on the communication and we will check how it is doing. So this is uh, well Minerva communication that is being done in the belly. There it is, OME. So this is where the, uh, this communicates with Minerva. So the mascot uh, also uh, uses the same system in terms of communication uh, with uh, Hayabusa 2. Someone's commenting about your necktie. Uh, sushi necktie. This is to commemorate the uh, moving of the Tsukiji market to the new place. I see. That's why. So in the press conference, uh, you explained various things. So Seoul. Uh, asteroid, how to say that in Japanese? One, well, one solar day, but it's different by celestial body. So, Mars solar day, I think that's the way to say it. So, asteroid day. So, uh, so one rotation of Ryugu is one soul. Yes. So we've been doing this seven hours. How many souls? 110 souls already. So two days ago, when we had the link, it was 101 souls. Let's change the camera. In the control room, we're seeing a large applause, most likely. We saw the Doppler. Uh, measurement of uh, the spacecraft withdrawing, uh, moving away uh, from the asteroid on schedule. So this uh, change in distance probably was uh, observed uh, with the Doppler. Uh, so uh, the way they were celebrating seemed natural today, uh, was not unnatural like before. Well, details uh, we will not know until we see the uh, telemetry, but uh, we saw uh, applause breaking out in the control room. So let's talk more about Minerva. 110 souls. That's like a Guinness Book record, isn't it? If you just count by soul, there was the, the MER uh, on Mars that's operating for more than 10 years. So maybe, well, with a shorter day, uh, we may catch up. No, no, we're not going to catch up uh, or surpass them. So in the previous uh, press uh, conference, you said that you have many images already. Minerva has taken many pictures. 
some yes we have many good and bad uh, images but uh, we have uh, continuous uh, uh, capture so, so p p position uh, image so Minerva doesn't send uh, this kind of uh, uh, photograph but uh, gives us a video well in terms of number of camera we have video 1a uh, where we have uh, 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 four cameras two wide angle and the not so wide uh, camera for stereo so so we shoot mainly with the uh, wide angle uh, they're uh, they're set uh, oriented 180 degrees to each other so what's uh, been uh, published already are all from the wide angle so it's being compressed uh, into several parts and uh, we are we want to take as many pictures so uh, we are compressing the images because we have many cameras uh, and the compression that is performed as usual and uh, the 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 judgment or decision made from the ground uh, no actually in the case of Minerva 2 the communication equipment on the spacecraft that is on during daytime because Minerva 2 is on the day side and when the communication is on meaning that uh, the their communication is always there whenever Minerva 2 is the reflecting light so rather than capturing images and store them before they are sent they take a shot and then send it back to the ground because it is no use of uh, just capturing images if they are not uh, is transmitted so there is a buffer as long as buffer has some room and then they would uh, keep on taking photos it's not that they take photos when it is on the opposite side unlike in the case of mascot it's not the primary battery it is subject to solar light and therefore it is a secondary battery or capacitor so it is recharged so in the absence of uh, solar light it does not function, therefore it cannot work when it is at the opposite side of the uh, asteroid. You are engineer in terms of training speciality. From science point of view, when you want to see a particular image uh, by Minerva, what kind of images are you interested in most? Well, image uh, that can uh, capture a huge amount of information, therefore cameras had to be there. And for other sensors, if they are small and compact, then they could be uh, on board, but this time not. So we thought of something that we want as sensors, and that's all that we installed. In fact, what turned out to be useful was a thermometer. There are several superficial pins which are embedded with thermometers whenever it hits the earth uh, the, the ground and then the, the the temperature is measured directly and there are multiple pins actually there are six of them some of them either uh, they're heading up or heading down and uh, some of them would touch the ground and the measurement is done in the case of Hayabusa 2, it has uh, the thermometer measurement in the remote fashion, and uh, it is quite useful and significant. There are two uh, technologies that are there for measurement of uh, temperature. Well, Minerva 2 is still up and running, and hope that they would continue to give us useful information. Now, based upon operation so far, and also something that you might wish for for the future, when we think about the future of Minerva 2, as long as it is, it is alive, then it will keep on operation. That's good. And with the robot 2, which is coming, the communication 
and the explorer, the spacecraft, hope that it will continue to function. What we can do with that in the future? Well, now we know what we can do with such technology deployed. For instance, uh, we often hear about the possibility of traveling around the asteroid, and I think there is a way to do that with technologies that we have. The, of course, program has to be changed, but with uh, the revised program, I think we can do that. So now we know fairly well because of uh, its uh, the sting on the asteroid, including the the temperature, the voltage, and the way the sunlight shines, and so on. So that uh, now that we know the environment fairly well, so if we deploy the same technology, what we can do, or if we upgrade the technology, what can we do? I think we have a very good idea about what we can do and hope that uh, this such would be applied in the future. So if you can tell us about the future possible application. Well, at present, we don't have a concrete plan. I can't say anything for sure, but from the point of view of capturing data, scientific data on the surface, yes, I think there are various ways of during that, that is, in the case we have to bring a sensor closer to the surface, but we're, even with the uh, the present uh, framework, I think we can do that. Of course, it could be quite challenging if we are to go into the night, but uh, and uh, we n need uh, innovative ideas. Otherwise, the system would get too large. I hope that the maneuver would. Uh, uh, be alive and kicking for many years to come. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoshimitsu. So, we heard about uh, Minerva 2 uh, from the father of Minerva 2, the partner of uh, Hayabusa 2. Now, the each function is trying to uh, get the information to confirm the how the uh, spacecraft is operating. It appears that uh, everybody is so busy so that uh, we can't uh, grasp uh, or catch someone from the room. Well, the, the so far they were all relying on Dopplers because telemetry uh, was not available. So they were in uh, intermission, so to speak. So we should have caught someone from that room to interview. Well, uh, the con in the control room, uh, they are currently in the process of confirming information. Well, the, uh, if this is the uh, TV broadcasting, then too long silence, that's not tolerated.
At present in the control room, they are trying to confirm uh, the status of uh, the spacecraft, uh, what is called the gate check. That is uh, to see whether uh, the conditions about the, uh, the spacecraft, whether they are fulfilled or not, they are confirmed by gathering information. Around uh, 25 minutes, 12.25, then the the telemetry will come to come back to function with the high gain antenna and then once again uh, we can confirm the condition of the spacecraft so that will be the timing uh this the timing will soon come to confirm uh, the how the spacecraft is operating Telemetry should return soon. So we have another big guest uh, to witness this moment. The guest uh, is uh, Dr. Kuninaka, currently Director General of ISAS of JAXA. He is the former Hayabusa 2 project manager. We have uh, big guests today, so telemetry should return soon. So you were the project manager of Hayabusa 2. So in the startup design, launch and operation you were involved. Now we've come to the stage of uh, doing rehearsals for the touchdown. So w what's your sentiment? Well, Hayabusa 2 has become much s smarter. Uh, it used to be uh, dumb, but uh, now has become much smarter and I'm happy for that. Thank you. We had uh, enough time to prepare, that's true, because last time uh, we failed, so this time uh, experts were uh, involved uh, and they spent the time and the energy uh, and uh, brushed up uh, the content and uh, today I was uh, uh, worried that it's going to uh, crash and break, so I'm relieved. So between Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2, I think the organizational setup has changed. I think uh, you gave it a lot of thought. Yes, 10 years ago, we did uh, the Hayabusa. And the past uh, uh, 10 years plus, I think uh, many people were uh, inspired by Hayabusa. And we had the great experts come together in this team and uh, they have uh, trained themselves for this moment and I think uh, we're seeing the result of that. So you were the project manager for Hayabusa 2 and uh, uh, you uh, were engaged on the ground uh, and had some intense experiences I'm sure. So what were the difficulties you encountered in development so many years ago I don't remember 
uh, maybe uh, more trouble after becoming director general. Well, uh, Imamura and uh, Hosoda, they uh, worked hard. They m made uh, great uh, ion engines. Uh, that phase has already been completed. We're now approaching. But the U-2 made great uh, engines. So you've already explained about uh, the operation up to this point? Yes. <laughs> so telemetry is back. Around 12.25. So... The, we now know the altitude, 134 meters, as high as the sky tree, so it has risen. So we're looking inside the control room. So they're uh, checking uh, what's the current condition uh, of the Hayabusa 2, whose communication has returned. So they will uh, add up the uh, results, or aggregate the results, and if there are no major uh, issues, they will decide that uh, they have uh, uh, cleared this uh, uh, issue. So each person in charge checking what they're uh, in charge of, and then they will aggregate uh, the information, and then the project manager will make the decision. So the uh, project uh, manager and flight director uh, are in the picture now. Was it the same organization setup for Hayabusa 1? It was not so systematic at that time. So each person uh, checking the conditions or the circumstances at uh, their terminals. So what were you in charge of uh, uh, at the time uh, Haya Hayabusa was there at uh, uh, the asteroid, you're in charge of the engine. So I, I was uh, uh, there not doing much, didn't have much. I was in charge of the ion engine. So my job was to get it to the asteroid. There's no more opportunity to, uh, to operate the ion engine. So I had nothing to do at that time. But uh, we were there only three months. So it was a rushed operation. So we didn't have this kind of a systematic uh, operation, so there was a lot of confusion for Hayabusa. So they said, uh, and the control room was so small, so don't come if you don't have a specific uh, uh, job or task. But I was worried about Hayabusa, so I didn't have uh, a task, so I was just watching from the back. And when things uh, uh, went wrong, I, I would uh, closely uh, approach the screen, and uh, I was right in front of the screen and the monitor near the end. But li like uh, it was the case t uh, today, uh, you only saw the Doppler data uh, and uh, uh, we were elated uh, or disappointed looking at the uh, Doppler uh, data and uh, uh, it uh, uh, approached, landed and it should rise but uh, it's, it's the data showed that it was on the asteroid and uh, so uh, we were so uh, worried with arms crossed, uh, we were just uh, staring into the screen. So with that experience, uh, probably you might feel that this operation is more sophisticated. Oh, very much so. Everyone uh, systematically uh, is in charge of uh, different tasks and uh, everyone uh, knows what's going to happen next. So. Uh, they're operating predictably, so much difference from uh, the first uh, project. So based on that experience of Hayabusa 1, uh, the residence time is one year and a half, and uh, there was sufficient uh, time uh, for the journey, and uh, so they're prepared. And they did a lot of uh, training using a simulator. I think that was quite effective. I think there are about 50 people uh, involved and uh, uh, they can take a coordinated action uh, in an organized manner. 
um, very different from how it was 10 years ago. So in a few minutes, we should be uh, able uh, to uh, confirm uh, the current mm -hmm. situation. So when we have some movement, we'll let you know. So Kuninaka-sensei, uh, you've risen in the ranks. You're the head uh, of uh, this institute. But uh, do you feel like you want to be on the ground and, and in the control room? I think it's better that I not be there. Uh, I would get in the way. So you leave it up uh, to the young people, successors, yes. So they're doing the gate check now in the control room. So the go, no go polling uh, has started. That was uh, first introduced by Dr. Kurinaka. So that's good. This is what uh, we, we said we should do. What are you talking about? What? So go or no go for each of the systems that's being displayed on the screen. So it's a 5 by uh, 5 uh, uh, and it's like uh, attack 25. So that's what that, that uh, uh, is called. So check is pr progressing. Now it's up to 880 meters now. So uh, uh, altitude uh, gain is substantial now. Right now, the confirmation is going on about the condition of the spacecraft. We hope we get images right now, but uh, because there is a sequence of operation, so first they are doing uh, what they can do right now like uh, the picture about the separation target marker on the surface of asteroid. Those are the images that uh, we want to see, but maybe we can't get that those images by 1 o'clock. The question is the, the following Doppler. It appears that the uh, target markers were really dropped, and then the target markers would be followed to maintain the, uh, the constant altitude. Well, at least uh, that's what is suggested by data. And then uh, the next step would be to confirm exactly where the target marker was dropped. If target marker was dropped right on the spot for a planned uh, landing spot, it appears that uh, the, they have done confirmation Gate 5 was done. It appears uh, that they are smiling, so they are happy with the result. Well, uh, we saw people were cheering around. I think there will be formal announcement later. But now with uh, Dr. Kuni Naka. I'd like to hear uh, from a somewhat higher perspective. But before that, Dr. Kuninaka, you were talking about touchdown point. This was taken at the time of the last rehearsal, R1A. This is the image captured then. In this case, altitude was 47 meters, and you see the shadow of Hayabusa 2. So uh, the we are planning for a touchdown in the area indicated by the uh, red uh, circle. And uh, this time, uh, the touchdown was actually released and dropped and hope that the touchdown actually landed within that circle. So if the target marker hits a bullseye, then that means uh, that uh, the 
spacecraft would uh, follow that and then try to land or touch down in case the, 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 the target marker is outside of the circle. And then in that case, we can get information about the difference uh, from the circle and therefore we will give an instruction uh, according to the program that uh, the Hayabusa 2 is expected to touch down relative to the position of uh, target marker. So the, the, the spacecraft can aim at the center of the red circle relative to the distance of target markers. Therefore, the exact position of a target marker becomes crucial. I understand that there is a press conference uh, where detailed information would be given then. It would take some time uh, before that information is gained and therefore I'm afraid we can't uh, get that information during this time. But as long as we know that it is on the surface and then through information uploaded on the website, I think we can disseminate that information earlier. Soda-san was uh, talking about uh, the discussion uh, from higher uh, level of the organization. That is, you shared with us your experience as a project manager, the former project manager, and now as a director general for JAXA and ISAS. What kind of activities uh, do you consider for the future based upon this experience? Uh, last week on Saturday, Japan time, the from Guiana, the Pepe Colombo, the Kulu, uh, that was a place, the, the Pepe Colombo was launched uh, for Mercury. It will uh, arrive uh, uh, seven years from now, so that will be around 2024. So it, it is going to be a long uh, journey. And also Akatsuki is currently traveling around uh, Venus and Hayabusa 2 is now exploring the Ryugu for the future MMX. That's about uh, the sample return uh, from the, uh, the moon, uh, 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 moon and uh, Mars and uh, then the asteroid, uh, the, 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 the flyby and Caesar that is a joint mission with the United States. The, that is from the Cherimos uh, Brasimenko, and that's uh, the comet that we are trying to gather sample. And also together with ESA, the JUICE, and that is about the Ganyme, and the, the, that's about uh, the satellite of the Jupiter. So in 10 years, we will cover uh, from Mercury to Jupiter with the spacecraft for exploration when they are all combined. Then, as you see here, with deployment of large number of uh, explorers in the past, we used to uh, sing, uh, the, the selected a single explorer to uh, the particular planet or asteroid, but now we're going to deploy a swarm of uh, satellites, uh, I mean the swarm of explorers or spacecrafts like other uh, space exploration fleet. This is a kind of the network that we want to accomplish in 10 years time. And that's the agenda that we are currently planning. And in 50 years, we want to complete them. And then after that, with this uh, the space exploration fleet, where to go next, and that's what is currently under conservation discussion and at the same time uh, working on new technology innovation. Uh, this was about the solar system exploration, but then uh, there will be another area that, uh, that is about uh, space astronomy and uh, astrology, and uh, this is another area, Astro Edge, uh, that field or astronomy. With your support at present, what is called the CRISM, uh, that's uh, the moon uh, exploration satellite, uh, the, the spacecraft. And X-ray 
is an electromagnetic wave with the uh, shorter frequency, the shorter wavelength. And then there is uh, the, the speaker, the explorer, that would uh, use uh, the infrared. Uh, this is the infrared, the astronomical satellite speaker, and also W first and a Athena. Uh, those are the projects that we want to be involved in through international collaboration. I mentioned earlier about uh, the solar system exploration. Uh, the, I mentioned that uh, the spacecrafts would be uh, deployed as the, uh, the swarm, as a fleet, and uh, in this area as well. By integrated uh, the frequency, we would uh, deploy the telescope and uh, microscope uh, or the microwave, uh, the, uh, the telescope uh, on the ground as well. They, we are trying to elucidate the long history of their solar system, which is uh, as long as 13.6 billion years with Hayabusa 2. We hope that uh, it would also contribute uh, to the journey that you have just mentioned. In other words, this is not the end of the story. This is a step forward toward the future. Yes, it is not... Uh, they're confined within one project, rather, a series of projects are going to be developed. And as a synergy effect, we hope to see the overall uh, accomplishment. We're still in the, the process of this uh, the journey and hope that uh, there, there, there would come a moment when we can celebrate together. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuninaka. So let's check the operation status. So in the control room, uh, we're going to try to find someone from the control room who can come to talk to us uh, as a guest. I think uh, we shift. Uh, well, we see now a guest. Uh, we're able to get one guest at the Hayabusa 2, in charge of the terrestrial systems. And this is Yonekura-san. Thank you for coming. So what kind of work do you do? So within JAXA, there is a, a tracking uh, technologies uh, network center. So in Saku City in Nagano Prefecture, there is the uh, Usuda Observatory. And the 60-meter parabola antenna uh, is uh, there and uh, it communicates uh, with the Hayabusa 2. It's a very important uh, ground station to communicate with Hayabusa 2, so I manage that. And, and when operating for the Hayabusa 2, we actually, I actually uh, look at what's coming in and uh, make decisions and give instructions. So in today's shift, what are you doing? In this uh, event, when we're communicating with Hayabusa 2, uh, I'm checking whether we are able to, to stably communicate and uh, if the instructions are uh, changed to radio waves and uh, being sent properly. So uh, I'm monitoring the situation and making decisions as we go along. So Tsukisaki-san was in charge of the overseas stations. I'm in charge of the domestic stations at Usuda. <laughs> so radio waves and communication is your field. Yes, in addition to that, there's a similar uh, parabola antenna in Uchinoura, so I manage uh, those as well. We've also developed and uh, managed those antennas and operate uh, at launch and uh, sending uh, commands to Hayabusa to, uh, well, there's a system uh, to send commands and check the health of uh, Hayabusa 2, so I've developed that as well. So you're the supporter behind the scenes. So yes, I don't come to the fore, and uh, so not very known. But without the parabola antenna, you cannot talk to the uh, Hayabusa 2. And various uh, spacecraft, we cannot communicate with them without those antennas. So not a flashy job, uh, but without this, we would not have uh, a space uh, exploration. So it's being used at a very high duty 
for today's operation. Were well, you been engaged? And it's moving steadily? Yes. We had a major event earlier. That is, well, with the telemetry, looking at the signals uh, from Hayabusa 2, we were in the process of checking, and uh, at that time, I was checking that uh, the ground station um, was maintaining uh, communication, the radio waves. So I s saw, uh, saw people uh, cheering, and uh, I was a little late in, in joining that celebration, but it's been a happy day. It's continuing, but it's already a happy day. So thank you very much for uh, coming uh, during your duties. Thank you very much. Next, another big guest, project scientist of Hayabusa 2, Dr. Watanabe. Please, please to be here. Sorry to ask you to come on short notice, so there are no slides. So, optical uh, issues were, were discussed about Hayabusa 2, and uh, so there will be scientific observation uh, continuing. Yes, with uh, descent we take uh, images, and at the time of ascent we took many pictures as well. So that data, well, at the de descent, various scientific equipment were used. But were you trying to do a certain science? Well, well from far away, it's difficult to uh, get the detailed images and data. So at the time of uh, descent, it's a great opportunity to uh, s see uh, things up close uh, and in an expanded manner. Of course, uh, there are limitations because the main uh, aim is the uh, land, but uh, we observe on the way. So uh, when we released Mascot and Minerva, we made various observations, uh, and so scientifically we were able to get a lot of important data in that process. So many scientific uh, and observation equipment uh, installed. So you uh, bring all of that together, and I think there are various requests coming to you. How do you handle that? I want to ask you. Well, scientific observation. Well, there is operation for scientific observation. So when to do it, what volume of data to take, that is coordinated. But uh, each of the equipment's uh, characteristics are known. So even before we go, we have this rough observation uh, plan. So now that we're approaching Ryugu, uh, we add some additional things we want to do, and uh, we put together a plan for observation. So you're a scientist, Dr. Watanabe. Looking at uh, this uh, operation, I see you uh, in the control room often, and I think uh, you've uh, become uh, knowledgeable enough that you can do operation. He's a university professor, but uh, he visits the control room often. Uh, seems like he lives next door. Yes, uh, I'm there, and uh, there's a lot of uh, excitement uh, and uh, anxiety, and I'm getting hooked, uh, and I come even when there's nothing to do. So from a scientific uh, perspective, you're uh, watching the operation close, and what do you feel based on that experience? Well, this uh, mission, uh, well, if it's uh, 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 Venus orbit, then it's you put together a plan. So operation and observation are quite separate. But with Hayabusa 2, in order to have the operation, you need uh, data from the scientific observation. Based on that data, next operation is planned, and then new data is uh, gained, and then you review once again the operation. So there is this feedback loop. So in that sense, it's a very interesting mission, but on the other hand, it means it's very difficult because you have to make decisions in real time uh, to think about what to do next. So science and engineering uh, it has to work hand-in-hand in, hand in this uh, mission. 
I think that is uh, executed well, especially the engineers, they make uh, uh, great uh, decisions. And so from the science side, we're able to get the precious data. We're quite excited about that. So camera, altimeter, their mission equipment, uh, and they're also equipment uh, for navigation and guidance. So equipment has those uh, uh, two aspects. So uh, in the West, uh, they separate uh, the scientific and navigational cameras. Uh, that has its strengths. But uh, for this project, because of various limitations, it's one. And I think that's uh, bringing about uh, some good effects as well, positive effects. Thanks to you. Well, Hayabusa 2 uh, is exploring an, an asteroid and various uh, people in the scientific uh, community uh, is uh, uh, participating. It's a big community. As a scientist on the ground, well, I, th I think scientists provide various uh, viewpoints. So science uh, about uh, asteroids, it's not just about how that asteroid was uh, made, uh, but the uh, characteristics uh, of the asteroid, it, there are substances on the uh, ground that uh, records what happened long time ago. And so we can observe them, uh, we can collect them, and uh, we can learn how the solar system was developed. So no matter how much you study uh, the vo uh, rocks on the Earth, uh, you don't know how the Earth was made. So exploring a very primitive asteroid uh, like Ryugu, which uh, retains uh, the characteristics uh, of uh, its primitive state uh, is uh, uh, very enlightening and so the scientists are very interested. So this, uh, the work of science will continue and uh, so what's your big scientific ambition? Can you share that uh, with us? Uh, well, Hayabusa 2 mission I've been involved for many many years. There were themes uh, that I could not pursue but the, so far uh, the the mission has been successful so far and with that the how the the solar system was created uh, that's the question coming from my speciality now I gained uh, many ideas and inspiration therefore by combining them with my knowledge I hope that we can create new science discipline together with young students and young researchers thank you very much uh, Dr. Watanabe for joining us despite the short notice. Well, it coincided with what Dr. Kuninaka was talking about. That is, the huge uh, one, a uh, large uh, the discipline in science could be developed by looking at different uh, kinds of uh, topics and themes, information by different scientists and engineers. I realize that we are running short of time well, in the control room for the explorer to come back to in position, uh, they are currently engaged in that uh, type of the operation to bring it back to home position. Well, the, the, during the time when we could not see what was going on, the information that is recorded and stored in Hayabusa 2 would be reproduced and uh, then we will get that information as well. So shall we wrap up? Well, I was uh, somewhat nervous because I was not sure whether this uh, the plan would work. Well, Hosoda-san, uh, you are quite experienced as the commentator. So the, uh, I thought I was in a good hand in leading discussion. Thank you. Well, actually, we're at the same age when we were young. That was at the time when Voyager and the big science projects were introduced, and we were so excited. And therefore, for the people in our generation, we hope that we can do something that can excite uh, the next generation, younger people. That's why we were working hard and hope that uh, this program as well would contribute to exciting next generation. Well, Hayabusa 2, this time uh, we introduced the rehearsal. I hope that uh, the, well, once plan is developed, uh, then 
whole preparation would continue so that uh, we would uh, the face uh, the touchdown and the asteroid and uh, hope that uh, we will come back uh, like this and uh, share the same time uh, share the same exciting time with you so oh uh, there is a schedule that is about uh, the uh, the plan uh, that is currently in place uh, that's about uh, the uh, the conjunction operation what is conjunction operation as you see here here is the earth and then on the opposite side of the the sun Ryugu and Hayabusa 2 are located therefore if you want to see uh, from the earth uh, the Hayabusa 2 and Ryugu you can't see them because the sun is in between because uh, the the two intensive uh, signal or input uh, from the sun uh, coming to the antenna. Therefore, during that time, Hayabusa 2 has to be the completely autonomous uh, for about a month. So during that time, we can't do anything. So the probably after uh, the beginning of next year, we we'll, would we'll consider touchdown. So we consider that touchdown would be next year. And also about the result that we gained this time. We confirmed up to separation of the target marker. And the weather target marker really hit the target on the ground. That's not yet confirmed. That it takes some time for collecting and analyzing data. So the on the website of JAXA we will report about uh, the 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 dropping the target marker and whether it really hit the target or not, that will be reported at regular press conference. It is just time to conclude this program. Today, we had uh, Hosoda and uh, the Imamura, former member of the Hayabusa 2 project. See you again on the next occasion. Thank you.